Good evening. Welcome to St. Louis and to the National Pastoral Musicians. We're at the 37th National Convention of the National Association of Pastoral Musicians, and we are here in the Exhibition Hall. It's opening day of this huge event. There's way over 2,000 people at National Pastoral Musicians. The uh, Exhibition Hall is opening tonight. The bar has opened now, but you won't be able to go there for another half hour, but everyone else is there. We are a, a Catholic organization, so that's, that's part of it. Uh, Pray Tell Blog is co-sponsored by the St. John School of Theology Seminary and Liturgical Press. I think you can see some of the Liturgical Press display uh, right behind us. And we were able to broadcast this afternoon at least part of the keynote address of Jerry Gallopo. So if you go to Pray Tell, within about a half an hour there will be an archive of that up there. And I'm going to turn off the sound on my little device here. And we're having a live panel tonight on the future of Catholic liturgical music. So a big thank you to my four honored guests who are with us tonight. And I, I wish to introduce uh, my friends to you briefly and then, then we will begin our discussion. We have with us Sister Mary Fran Fleischacher, who is a professed member of the Dominican Sisters of Adrian, Michigan for 50 years. She was 11 when she joined <laughs> and she said, you, you can, like yeah, you can, you, we can do the math on that. Um, Sister Mary Fran has hymn texts published with World Library at OCP. She has published also with liturgy training publications. She has an MA in pastoral studies and an MA in religious studies and her doctorate, her D-min is from CTU in Chicago. She has done ministry and teaching and retreat work and directing worship and liturgical music. And Mary Fran is currently adjunct professor of theology at, at Barry University in Miami. So it's good to have you here, Mary Fran. I know her from North American Academy of Liturgy. We're in the music seminar together there. Also with us is Jerry Gallopo from another publishing house. I can never remember the name. No, I'm no Lit Press. <laughs> I'm so glad that Jerry's with us. He's uh, from J.S. Pollock Company and World Library, of course, in Chicago. That great resource for excellent liturgical music. And uh, Jerry has been active in parish ministry, and he's done a lot of work around the implementation of the RCIA. Jerry spends one fourth of his time on the road uh, presenting. So he's, he's a real authority. And, and he gave us the plenum address this afternoon on uh, good news for a wounded people. And that ties into the theme of this NPM convention this year, uh, which is, what's the theme of our convention? Proclaim, good news. Proclaim good news. And Jerry certainly did that with aplomb. Also with us is Jennifer Kerr Breedlove Budziak from Chicago. Uh, do you go by Jennifer or Jenny? Jennifer, please. Jennifer. Jennifer. I know Jennifer from the National Advisory Council of NPM. Jennifer is from Chicago where she's a liturgical musician, author, conductor, cantor, widely published and recorded composer and arranger of liturgical music. She is still on the National Council of NPM and completing a doctorate in choral conducting. She already has master's degrees in choral conducting and in theology. And Jennifer was director for liturgical music at the Office for Divine Worship in the Chicago Archdiocese, has taught at the university level, has authored several books, and her newest book from 2012, listen to this title, this really sounds intriguing, Sowing Seeds Bearing Fruit, a five-year process for growing a singing congregation. You mean Catholics, I take it. <laughs> <laughs> Even, wonderful. <laughs> Also with us um, from Minnesota, just a little bit down the road from the Abbey, is Paul Westermeyer, longtime professor at Luther Seminary in St. Paul and director of the Master of Sacred Music program, a joint program with St. Olaf College. And Paul has been choir master and organist at several churches, also an ordained pastor. He and his wife, Sally, have four children 
children and nine grandchildren, and he has pastored Lutheran congregations. His doctorate from the University of Chicago is on 19th century church music. That was with Martin Marty, I believe. And Paul is the author of several major books, including Te Deum, a major study of church music, Let the People Sing, a textbook on hymnody, which I used in, in our hymnody class just a year ago, The Companion to the Lutheran Hymnal, Evangelical Lutheran Worship, and he has co-authored a book that will be coming out this fall, which is a study of the history of U.S. church music. So we have a quite diverse group sharing their wisdom with us. And we are talking tonight about the future. Where is liturgical music going today? And I'd like to begin by just going around the circle, and I'd like to give each of you uh, a chance to answer the question, what do you think is a major influence that's at work uh, influencing the direction of liturgical music today? So how, how do you see it? And you can go first if you wish, sister. Okay, thanks. Well, I guess um, what came to my mind pretty quickly was culture. I live in a very culturally diverse part of the United States, as though the rest of the United States isn't culturally diverse. But it's been, uh, for me, a real classroom uh, of trying to understand what are some of the issues that people face in, you know, especially when the uh, United States isn't their first uh, country of origin. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm not the first to say that I think culture is one of the huge issues that we're dealing with now. Not only culture ethnically, but sociologically uh, as well. So I guess that's that would be my first uh, response. Mm. Okay. Can I just follow up right away? Say a little bit more about it. Uh, can you just say how is culture influencing it for better or new challenges, or in what ways is culture changing? Well, I think one of the things that I notice uh, with the, for example, the students I work with at Barry University, it's very difficult, uh, and I worked in campus ministry there with worship and music for five years before what I'm doing now. Um, I always felt it was, a, a, it was a, a big question to me, what has been their experience of church? What has been their experience of uh, worship and music before they come to a place like Barry University? And I'm talking primarily the Catholic students. Uh, although we, you know, we we have done praise and worship and so on with students there, but uh, I felt it was really the style of worship, the style of music. Their experience has shaped what they expect. For example, uh, as as young people, from the kind of worship. And I remember a student telling me, you know, I just can't come to mass uh, at the chapel because it's so dead. And of course. Uh, you know, as a woman of a certain generation, I'm very comfortable moving with certain kinds of music, uh, rhythms, and so on. But I found that the students were frozen <laughs> themselves, even the students that I worked with in music ministry. And so uh, I kind of got the idea that the students who really wanted lively worship were not there. They were somewhere else. And even though we really tried to do a diverse styles of, of music and so on. So this has been my life the last, last seven and a half years. And Miami um, is a trilingual city. The, the Archdiocese of Miami is a trilingual church, uh, English, Spanish, and Haitian Creole. So this has been in front of me. And, and I realize that, for example, even among the Spanish population, there is a great deal of diversity, and I'm learning from that all the time. And I'm very unfamiliar with their background and uh, their repertoire and so on. So that's kind of what I mean. Uh, I don't know if that helps or makes it more cloudy, but... <laughs> a lot of cloudiness that we will come back We can come back to. Yeah, a lot to say yeah. there about cultural diversity. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Jerry? Well, I think I'd like to... Um, I've been thinking about this question, and I, I have a, a little bit of a conflict between what I do professionally, which is publish music, and my own life as a, as a, as a Pew Catholic. Um, the last year as a Pew Catholic, kind of itinerant, having left a, a parish that I was involved in for about 10 years, and kind of visiting different places now. And um, for me, very personally, the future 
of liturgical music or where I see the direction going in my own life is I'm looking for music and texts that will touch my heart and nourish my relationship with the Lord Jesus. Uh, and whatever trends happen, my hope is that those trends are going to feed that particular need in me. Uh, that's one strand. As a publisher, it's very challenging to try to figure out where this is going. Uh, culture is one, one issue. Musical style is another issue. Uh, but I, the more I thought about the question, the more I, I thought that maybe my own personal experience might just be what the answer is for the publishing experience as well. As I travel around the United States and Canada, I, I go to Mass in many, many places all the time, and I think what, not, not the 50 to 100 people who are into church, into church, into church, who are going to make the parish run, but everybody else that's sitting there, I think basically they're coming in with their lives, looking for music to somehow make sense, put their lives in conversation with what the Lord did for us and move them along. As to what you're saying. Thanks for that, Jerry. Jennifer, what's happening as you see it? As I was thinking about this and, you know, even at this first day of the convention, I've been so struck again with how quickly technologically we're growing in terms of communication. Um, how the world has in many ways just gotten so much smaller and we can instantaneously, you know, be having a face-to-face -face conversation or a text-based conversation with someone across the world. We can hear any piece of music, we can access almost any piece of information we want to. Um, and at the same time, while I, I mean, I, I have made very dear friends through online meetings, so I mean, it, not in any way to deny the amazingness of some relationships that can develop that way, I think we do run a little bit of a risk just as humans of becoming physically isolated from each other, even as we communicate, even as we can touch each other in some ways, you know, from very far away. And what we do in our churches on Sundays, getting live human beings all in the room together, hopefully getting live human beings joining together in song, raising many voices to literally physically become one voice. And that's something that, you know, it transcends any genres, any styles of music. Um, I think it's something that we do less and less in other areas of our life to interact with a large, large group or small group in that way. And I think in that way, liturgical music, what we do there, it's becoming more and more countercultural, just simply not even what we sing about as much as the fact that we sing is so far removed from many experiences that I think that itself is a thing of great power and is, I think people are beginning to hunger a little more for that. You hear a lot more decrying of, oh, nobody talks to each other, nobody's, you know, everybody's on their phones and nobody looks at each other. And I think there's beginning to be this hunger to how can we reconnect and really connect with each other in that way. So. The human connection technology. Yeah, very good. Good points. Paul? I think I would also say the culture, but I would have a little, well, a somewhat uh, same and somewhat different spin on what the two of you, Mary and Jennifer, have said. Uh, 20 years ago, or let's say 25, somewhere in that range, the students who were pushing the hardest were pushing against anything which was, quote, traditional. So that um, what they wanted was what might now be called contemporary Christian or something like that. There was a um, resistance among some people, but they were afraid to say anything because they were the Neanderthals. And so it was a bad idea to object. But most recently, the students I've encountered 
are reversed somehow. And the, the people who were afraid to say something now are a little bit more willing to say something. So on a paper, there will be a parenthesis that follows the word conte words contemporary music and somebody will say, I hate that in parenthesis. And I've also discovered that some recent students feel they have been cheated by what the churches and the schools have done by denying them the heritage in some, whatever that may mean to them. One, for example, one person said, my class in school that was presumably art and music was really an hour for the rest of the teachers to have a study period and just to entertain us. And they feel, they feel, really feel cheated. I, I, I sense a certain, almost an anger. So that, that still is in a sense a cultural influence, but it's a countercultural influence as well. And now it's way, way more complicated. And then also there is this grain of mustard seed subterranean influence in the church all the time where the trendy always disappears and what relates to the flow of the liturgy remains. <laughs> and so you have that always in tension with the commercial culture, obviously the commercial culture looks like it's on in, in control because everything and everybody is for sale and music is a means to sell things. So that's where everybody looks, if, and you can use music as an, attractive, as an attractive tool, of course. But then there's this push and people don't quite know that the church has historically said music is for the glory of God and the edification and sanctification of human beings. It's not a manipulative tool. And so uh, quietly under the surface, there's that push too. But it makes it, as you all have said, a very complicated time to figure out what to do that's faithful. Something like that. <laughs> so lots of change going on, lots of different angles. You're naming lots of important cultural and societal change trends. Change going on, but it's, at the same time, there is this continual current, which is always changing. But it's not. But but the issue, it seems to me, is not change exactly. It's what kind of change. What are we doing here, and why are we doing it? I'd like to ask all of you this question as you name these changes going on. I want to take the temperature of the room. Uh, how hopeful, how fearful are you? As you name all of these changes, how much of it seems for the good? How much of it seems like a negative challenge? What's your sort of basic stance from a position of faith and hope about what's going on? The Holy Spirit can be trusted. And si I'm, I'm serious about that. Since that is true, I'm very, very hopeful. I, I'm not hopeful about what we always do. I was going to say, can we, the church be trusted? Her leaders no, and her ministers. No, the church can never be trusted. We're all <laughs> sinful. Musicians and pastors and people, all of us together, and we always screw it up. We also do some wonderful things as well. But nonetheless, if the church is sustained by what we do, there's no hope. But the Holy Spirit, the, this, the church belongs to God. Uh, what? Who was it? Is it Benedict uh, who said, I'm not sure, maybe it was John Paul, I'm not sure. There was this story, he went to, every night he went to say his prayers and said, who's in charge of this church, you or me? And the answer always came back, go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> right, I don't know who that is, or if it's really true. Or, is it John? Saying John it's it was a difficult day with troubles on every front. It's all uh, a big challenge in the church, but God, it's your church and I'm going to bed well, I'm now. going to bed, right? <laughs> <laughs> so the Holy Spirit can be trusted. That's what I want to say about that. So hopeful words on that front. I mean, I'm very hopeful, although, you know, kind of along similar lines, I expect it's going to be a huge mess. And it's because it's people. I mean, and, and it, figuring things out is always going to be tremendously messy. Um, 
I, you know, it was interesting when, when you asked me to be part of this, I went back and watched last year's panel to see, you know, what did people talked about last year. And right in the beginning of the talk, the whole question of, you know, moving into a postmodern way of thinking came up. And this idea that, um, you know, you have your linear history and then we sort of hit this point where all of a sudden the linear development got thrown out the window and everything is this free for all and you can, people are pulling from, you know, different places and different ideas and it's all, it's all game. Uh, and, but at the same time, I mean, it seems like the, there's that current, I, I too trust that the Holy Spirit will, you know, draw it together and find us. I mean, I've been, I've been actually studying, you know, part of my studies have involved postmodernism and how, how are musicians dealing with that in the more art music world and watching, you know, these composers pull threads from Renaissance motets and, you know, just different pieces and pulling it all together and creating something new and amazing. And if you tried to explain it beforehand, it would make no sense. But then once it happens and you look at it, you go, whoa, yes, I see. And I can only hope that that's where we're headed, that we're all kind of going, what? But down the line, we can look and say, yes, thank you, Holy Spirit. We knew you were there. Now we get it. Maybe we won't ever get it. You know, I think sometimes... Um Musicians, even those here, forget that um, art is at the core of what they're doing. And just very simply what art can do to the human mind, to the human heart, to the human spirit. And of course, we believe that the art that we create is inspired by the Holy Spirit. And that, you know, you know I, I just more and more convinced looking out there and looking into the society and into the culture that that art is needed to bring us beyond what this crap is that we're constantly fed every day about what our real life is supposed to be. Because it's, it's a mess, it's false, and uh, not, not totally false, <laughs> but, uh, but that sense that, um, that good art, well-trained musicians in whatever genre and, you know, can move people um, because it's art to a level that I don't think they ever experience a normal discourse. Certainly in the business world, I mean, I'm imbued in that. There's not much that's happening that's uh, pulling us there. Um, but I, th I think art is, uh, is one of our answers. Well, I'd like to refer to something you said uh, earlier this afternoon about polarization, and it's not new, but if, if I was going to say what scares me, that's it. Um, I think polarization, um, like where's, where is the middle going to hold, you know, is, is kind of when I think about things like that, that's what I think about. On the other hand, I, I think, you know, I think as I live into different generations and see uh, the kinds of questions that um, younger people are asking. Some of them are the same human questions that we, every generation asks. But I think, you know, um, as the ebb and flow of cultural change happens, the, the vacuum that's created is where people are looking, you know, for, uh, for what they need and what they... Um. So I think out of that is there's hope, I think, because even though we can't control that ebb and flow, obviously, although it'd be nice to think we could develop a plan that would solve that issue. For me, polarization is the scariest thing. Um, in the, two or more. Ah, now that is, that is something good to think about. I guess basically, referring to what you said before, um, those who resist what's currently uh, happening and pull away from it, you know, and then those who are more comfortable allowing the evolution to take place and kind of trusting it. I think, to me, those are kind of like the two poles. And you could call them countercultural and cultural, but I don't think it's that simple. I, th I, th I think it's... Um, 
a little different than that. I think of, of the Second Vatican Council, and the words that come to me are continuity and discontinuity. We, some of us experienced radical discontinuity there in the 60s and um, early 70s. And, you know, the generation that I work with wasn't alive, you know, at that time. They never experienced that, you know. So to, that's what I think I mean about uh, generational differences that kind of keep the pendulum moving around, which is, I think, a healthy thing and a hopeful thing. But the radical pulling apart, that's what... Do you really that, think it's generational, though? That's a good question. Maybe you could say. Well, well, for example, I was in California visiting a church, and I saw a high school kid. And they had two services in this church, one contemporary, one traditional, or whatever they called the contemporary one. I said to him, well, um, how is that contemporary service? He said, oh, come on. I never go to that. That's superficial. Then, in another church, there's an 80-year-old woman going to the contemporary service. Now, according to the statistics, that's all wrong. But every time I talk to actual human beings, the statistics never quite match up, which seems to me <laughs> makes it way more messy. On the other hand, it's way more human than any statistical tabulations can possibly tell you. And the deal is, it seems to me, the hope, I would guess, not only that the Holy Spirit can be trusted, but she can be trusted. And that's a hopeful thing in the process of what I'm going to say. But, but all of us in our local communities figure things out finally on the basis of whom we have to serve, not on the basis of statistical tabulations. <laughs> yeah. And I think I see now what, you, what your question was about generations. I don't think I meant that that just because folks are young that that they want a certain thing or just because pe people are older no i just i think i meant the ebb and flow of of the way life evolves in every generation kind of puts a focus on certain areas i think yeah that's kind of what i meant no i agree with you cuz i too think the younger generation is more uh, leaning a little bit more toward uh, reclaiming the heritage which they never experienced. Yeah. If I were to generalize but where young people were at, I would say they're all over the place. Uh, they're all what? They're all over the place. I think more of them are not as involved in the church as previously. Those who are involved in the church, many of them are more traditional or even ultra conservative. But even that, it's it's a mix. It's actually quite complicated. Well, we have about one minute left, so I'm debating which big question we should bite off next. Uh, I think we'll, we'll stop there. Uh, so we've really opened up the whole theme of, of the convention here. We've really, uh, I'm impressed by the amount of hope that I'm hearing from all of you. Lots of change. Uh, the rate of change is increasing, but through all of it, I'm hearing trust in the Holy Spirit, and I think also in people who at times can be inspired by the Holy Spirit. So I think that's a wonderful place to start our Pray Tell Live broadcasting. There will be another panel on Wednesday. The editor of Pray Tell Blog now actually is not I, but Nathan Chase, and he'll be leading a panel on Pope Francis on Wednesday, and then on Thursday I'll be leading another panel on rubrics and enculturation and creativity and uniformity and church unity. So tune in for all of it. There's also several one-on-one -on -one interviews coming. So watch all of it at Pray Tell. Thank you to my friends and panelists and good evening to all of you. <laughs>